Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Greg Dyke. Uh, I live in Minifee County, Kentucky, and I'm a yak farmer. Uh, yaks uh, are a species uh, related to the boss taurus, the cattle species, uh, and actually they, they were part of a common thread that separated about one to two million years ago. Uh, they're a highland animal originally, and most of the yaks, 13 million of them, are in, in the Hil Himalaya mountains, China, North India, and that area. And the ones that are now are in Europe and the United States actually came from there. So they're used to an altitude of 10 to 13,000 feet, uh, yet they adapt well to even the lower lands here of Kentucky. Um, the reason we uh, are interested in yaks is because they, they are a multi-purpose animal. Uh, you've got meat, uh, high quality fiber. They have an under uh, down coat under their hair uh, that can be harvested and it's like cashmere. They can be used for milk, which they are in the Tibetan region, uh, but they can be used for like gourmet cheese and things like that here. And then uh, they also have, have other uses like pack animals and trekking. So like in Alaska, if you go there, you can actually rent a yak to go packing in the mountains. Uh, the bulls are about 1,200 pounds and the cows weigh about half that. And there's a real advantage there because you're not raising a big animal in order to produce uh, a meat animal, uh, uh, a male. So there's a savings there. It takes them about three years to read about 90, reach about 90% maturity. Uh, but you can breed them at just over two years as long as they're going to weigh 500 pounds uh, at calving or be three years of age. Bulls usually are ready to go by two years, at least they think they are. Um, your calves are small, 25 to 35 pounds, which is great for uh, less calving problems. They will do the job unless there's simply something functionally wrong. Uh, in terms of fiber, here's a picture of it. It's a, it's a down that you actually just comb out. You don't have to cut the hair or anything. Uh, and the fiber, you can, you can sell it for $20 to $60 a pound. Uh, you know, it, and it's, it's in demand, which is good. It's, it's very popular, and the socks there are made from yak fiber. The meat is a great meat. It's a red meat. It's lean, very lean, so you have to be careful in cooking it high protein to calorie ratio, and it contains omega-3 oil. Some people compare it to a skinless chicken in terms of the health benefits, others compare it to salmon. And the nice thing about it is just ground yak meat sells for at least $10 a pound, and steaks will go 35 to 40 pounds. Uh, live weight animal is at least $2 a pound, and partly because the demand exceeds the supply. There are only about 7,000 yaks in the United States. The problem with the demand and supply is that if you locally say you, you get restaurants or whatever interested in your yak and yak meat, it's hard to keep up with the demand. Uh, so that's why people are always uh, looking around the country for yaks to buy for meat. Okay. Uh, we, at our farm, we do, we do breeding stock. It's all DNA tested. Uh, we sell fiber. And instead of doing the meat, we do yak jerky. We, we're in a, a partnership with a couple other yak farms and produce the jerky. And the, the reason for doing that really was to try to avoid the, the idea of developing a demand and we couldn't meet it. Uh, so the jerky sort of, you're able to produce a head and have it ready to go. Uh, the jerky we sell, it's four ounces and it goes between 12 and $15 a bag. Um, so you, you can make decent money on it, okay? Our farm, and this is uh, kind of the key to the whole thing, obviously, is uh, 60 acres, roughly, of pasture land. It's divided into 11 pastures of about five to six past, or acres per pasture. Uh, when we started, uh, about five years ago, we started with about 30 to 35 yaks, and we were working about 30 acres of the pastures that were ready. And we could barely sustain the 30 to 35 yaks on the, the 30 
plus acres of land through the summer. Uh, the forage was that bad. It, it lasted about seven months, and about August, you sort of wondered if you'd have to start bringing hay in, but, you know, we had some rain and it came back. Uh, because we're in Menifee County, we have that particular advantage of being the home of fescue, and uh, not only fescue, but we, we have we have fescue with 100% endophytes, so we're right at the top of the ladder in terms of uh, so-called fescue quality. The, the interesting thing is you think animals from the Himalaya mountains would eat anything that's green. Well, of course, the yaks just turn their nose up at fescue until after uh, fall frosts and things like that. I guess it, it tastes better to them, okay? So, uh, the thing that we had to do really is, you know, look at, look at the pasture land uh, because we buy our hay and, you know, we bought local hay first, which of course had fescue, and then we bought hay from Lexington from the horse farms, which, which was pretty good, but not great uh, to sustain the herd. But, you know, if you're, if, when you look at the economics, you know, your hay prices are absolutely huge in, in running the operation. So forage management was a key thing. And what we started to do and kind of the, the key things that we discovered were, you know, soil quality, uh, testing, you know, on an annual basis, looking at the nutritional value and yaks require a little less nutritional value than your beef cattle do. We control, match the plants to the animals and test the hay. And all of these were learning things for us. And, you know, I'm a, a beginning farmer, less than five years. So for me, this is all new stuff that I'm sharing with you, okay? So our soil quality stunk, basically. Uh, here's the information from a few years ago. And, you know, the pH was 4.9. Uh, it needed over three tons per acre. Some areas needed four tons per acre. Uh, nitrogen, it, you know, depending on where you were, if you're in the middle of some clover that happened to be there, didn't need anything but other places at least 50 pounds per acre. And again, uh, along with the fescue, which was probably 80% of the property, we had some bluegrass, crabgrass, a little bit of orchard grass, lots of weeds, and so on. And the soil test was where we started. And uh, where we are now after four years is our pH is up to 6.5, don't need any nitrogen. And uh, all, all we need is really some phosphorus and a low amount of 30 pounds per acre. And the, you could just look at the land and see that it's different. And the, the thing now is that where we started at 30 or so animals on 30 acres, we now can sustain, and we did last year 100 animals, and now we're running 80 plus on uh, almost the same amount of land. Uh, the, and for a full eight months, and maybe this year even go farther. So that reduces the hay cost. And the quality of the, the animals is much greater. The uh, calf weights are up, calving weights are up, uh, sort of more at the higher end, and the animal weights are up, and it's just a more robust herd. Every, everybody looks and acts healthier than just than the baseline of a few years ago. What we started doing uh, right off once that first summer was over and it looked so dismal is we plowed urea three times a year sort of uh, through the through the pasture season followed soil test applied fertilizer we overseeded with a with a rental unit and we used rotation we tried both uh, the intensive rotation where you you load up the animals and rotate them through quickly as well as a slower rotation where we tried to match animals to pasture size and do it at a slower basis and then bush hog three times a year for weed control. The key uh, to this whole thing for us and probably for everybody is the grass in the pasture, the hay you buy, and the dirt. And those are the things we worked on. Next one. Soil, what it grows, what you buy if you're not producing your own hay. And the key thing, and my son said, you got to go to this. Went to the UK Forage School, went there a couple years ago. And 
you know, the, the, the key learning, and it's in a sense, it's obvious, and yet you need to have it, people like me need to have it told to them several times for a week, is that the yaks will improve as the forage improves. Improve the land, improve the forage, the rest will follow. Just the fact that you bought the best yak doesn't mean anything when you put it on crummy ground and crummy grass. So that's what I do. And you know, I, I wish as I think back to my education that, that I learned this stuff about forage a long time ago and about soils and so on. Because it, as it says here, and I noted before, just after three years, the calves are 10% bigger. They're, they pop out healthier, stronger, eating, yearling uh, weights are 20% higher. Uh, again, the herd is more robust. And again, you know, this school for me was so important because it, you know, it taught about the pasture management, the, the forage production rates, what's required, what the animals need and so on, as well as weed control, uh, better ways to do it, and knowing what to do and when to do it, which is important, okay? So what we did after uh, my attending the school that was new was, you know, again, continue the, the analysis of the soil, but also, and work on that, but also look at the pasture forage quality and the purchased hay, because as you know, you can purchase junk. The price is right, but you know, my animals would waste 50%. With the, with the hay that I buy now, they don't waste anything. And so there's a cost savings, even though the hay costs more per pound or per ton. Also, uh, you know, I was introduced to uh, broadleaf herbicides and, and not to use it every year or anything like that. But I'll tell you, the first time I used it, the quality of the grass that grew was immense uh, the following later that year. And then rotational grazing. And again, they, they talk about high density. And I tried that and it worked, uh, but then I went to a lower density where I could match the number of head per acres in the pasture based on what I did, had learned about forage production expected per pasture uh, per year, okay? So with yaks, uh, there's, there's a problem in this, just basically a lack of information globally. Uh, the Chinese and the Indian uh, of India are the ones who know the most and we're trying to learn. So one of the problems with the yaks is, you know, they didn't like the fescue and they pick around and look like they're making putting greens through all, throughout the pasture, but you know, mainly fescue left. So what was it they wanted to eat? So the uh, cooperative extension agent, uh, Mary McCarty and Dr. Jimmy Henning uh, from UK proposed a yak garden, which is what this is here. And they put multiple kinds of forage in there. We raised the forage up, turned the yaks in, and watched what they ate. And of course, they didn't eat the, the, uh, any kind of fescue, didn't like it at all. But they liked crabgrass, and they liked rye, and they liked orchard grass, and a little bit of red clover. Uh, so then the, the thing was, okay, how do we get introduce that into the pasture? Overseeding wasn't great. Uh, it did some good. Uh, and now what we're trying to do is during the winter, I try to let the yaks just destroy areas. Uh, they cooperate somewhat, but the, as, I, as I watch the pastures, there's less and less fescue, and that allows me to plant more, okay? The other thing is, you know, so if I, if I improve the grass that I grow, that's great, but, you know, you've got the hay end, and how do you know what's the most effective, cost-effective hay for production versus dollar? And so uh, we have a project going on with UK again. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Lemkuler uh, is, is leading it. And what we've done is divide a pasture up into four smaller pastures. And we're gonna do a, a study weight gain as a function of hay, the type of hay. And we're gonna look at alfalfa, orchard grass, pasture grass mix, and our baseline of fescue, good old Minifee hay. So that's that's the new thing that we're doing this year so we can optimize the actual hay purchase. And optimization is in terms, you know, of course, total nutrition and that sort of and digestibility as well as cost. And where we're heading off in the future uh, in terms of what we're working on is, you know, how do you get rid of the fescue? Because everybody says it'll come back. 
to how to get rid of it and really maintain a pasture of higher quality. Continue to look at what forages produce the best grain. And so we'll reuse, you know, we'll rerun our forage test a number, a number of times. Improve data collection. And this is really important, not just weights and things like that and how things are improving, but as the quality of the pastures improve and so on, you kind of uh, take out uh, the, the problem of bad grass, you know, insufficient grass, insufficient uh, nutrition and so on. And that then begins to let you compare the cows side by side in terms of what they're doing and allows you to really properly call the herd, uh, knowing that they're sort of all on the same ground in terms of, of what they're eating and how it affects them and so on. So that I'm excited about. We're going to continue the, the typical soil and forage improvement. And then we're also going to look at uh, the introduction of warm season grasses, which would be new to us, uh, with the idea of production amount and also how much uh, you can extend the growing season. Because we're up to eight months now. You know, if I can extend it to nine months, you know, I'll save $3,000 in purchased hay. So, so it's a real important thing. And that's where herd of about 80. Uh, you can do other things with yaks. Uh, they are like raising teenagers. You can train them if you want. It takes a lot of work, but you'll have a herd of, of sort of snooty teenagers running around that, that give you a hard time at, and also cooperate and love on you. Uh, one of the interesting things now is you can train your yaks to do all kinds of things. They're great pack animals. Uh, again, you can train them to milk. It takes work because even though they call domesticated yaks, the domestication takes some time, but you can also ride them. And if you really want to do something exciting, you could probably rent Churchill Downs and you could have an official uh, Kentucky or an American yak race, which has never been held. This is in Mongolia. Uh, speed is not a huge issue. Hanging on might be a greater one. Great animals. And again, thank you for the, the chance to share what I've learned.